is allowed to like butterflies, and who isn't? I used to live in San Francisco. I was walking down Mission Street one day, and there was a street vendor who was selling these colorful, glittery paper butterflies that were tied to strings, and they were being blown about in the wind. A woman was walking by, pushing a little boy in a stroller, and the little boy was no more than three. And he said to her, Mira las mariposas, look at the butterflies. And without missing a beat, she said, A los niños no les gustan las mariposas. Little boys do not like butterflies. And my heart went out to that little boy. He was this beautiful, open hearted little being, already being fed made up stories about how he should be as a man. I'm a public health researcher and practitioner. And in 2008, I started a project where men and folks who identify with masculinity publicly share personal stories that take a critical look at what they were taught about manhood and masculinity. It's called the Men's Story Project. And we create events where men share their stories with live audiences with the ultimate goal of fostering healthy notions of masculinity and supporting well being and equality for people of all genders. And so I'm excited to share some of what I've learned from this work with you tonight. So, why did I start this project? Many people ask me this. As a university researcher, I spent several years doing studies related to adolescent sexual health, mental health, dating violence, sexual assault. I've worked at a rape crisis center and with a gang risk intervention program in a San Francisco public school. And I spent eight formative years co facilitating a support group for mostly young gay men and transgender women who were living with HIV AIDS in the San Francisco Bay Area. And as I was doing this work early in my career, it felt increasingly evident to me that these social challenges that I was working to address had something important in common. They stemmed in part from idealized, harmful, and restrictive notions of what it means to be a man. And it became clear to me that if we could just help to shift these kinds of made up stories about manhood, that it could help to prevent many different kinds of suffering for people of all genders. So here is a disturbing collage, if you will, that shows more of the picture. So the belief that men should be dominant and aggressive contributes to men's physical, sexual, emotional, and other violence against people of all genders. Fear of being ridiculed often keeps men from speaking up when they see other men doing abusive things. Being rewarded for toughness and strength contributes to bullying, hazing, uh, steroid use, and guys who keep playing when they're injured. And studies have found that men do all kinds of things to perform their masculinity, like binge drinking, drunk driving, not using condoms, which increases risk for traffic fatalities, addiction, and HIV. Dominant scripts about manhood also have emotional impacts. Men who feel that they shouldn't share their feelings are more likely to experience loneliness and depression and have less emotionally intimate relationships. And men who think that they should be self reliant tend to seek care for their physical and mental health needs later and less than women. But this lack of care, combined with men's higher rates of risk taking, means that many more men than women die every year from most leading causes of death, including cancer, heart disease, and suicide. And with regard to violence, studies have even found that mass shootings, which are an epidemic in our society are often committed by boys and men who feel their masculinity was disrespected in some kind of way. Because they don't conform to gendered expectations, LGBTQ young people deal with elevated rates of bullying and hate crimes and getting kicked out of their parents' homes and ending up homeless, amongst many challenges. And then, of course, we see the impacts of gender inequality across our society, including the workplace and the home. So, there is a lot here, and this is just a quick overview. Uh, but the bottom line is that harmful social notions about masculinity contribute to a wide range of public health problems. And these problems, or these notions of manhood, are often entwined with 
racism, sexism, homophobia, ableism, and other oppressive ideologies. Okay, so there's good news here, uh, which is that these problems are preventable, right? Because they start with what's in our hearts and our minds. They start with culture. Social ideas about gender are taught and learned, like the little boy in the butterflies, like who wrote that rule that he's not allowed to like them? Where is that written? Who enforces it? Uh, so social ideas about gender vary across time and place, across communities and cultures. And so if some of these ideas are fostering harm, we can take action to change them. And then the question is, how, right? So social science research around the world is finding that a key way to help foster healthy notions of manhood is to use a fancy ancient technology called talking about it. <laughs> Okay, specifically, we can help people take a critical look at the cultural soup that we all swim in, that we often take for granted as natural, normal, unchangeable, boys will be boys. Right? And instead, we can ask ourselves, what was I taught about gender and how people of different genders should act and relate to each other? We can ask, have any of those ideas contributed to harm? And if the answer is yes, we can ask, how can I push back and do things differently in my own life, in my relationships, and in my community? So, to catalyze and normalize public dialogue on these topics, I started the Men's Story Project, to create local forums where men and folks who identify with masculinity could share their stories that address these issues. And I was eager to see what would happen when men started sharing not more tales of sexual conquest or athletic achievement, but true stories about their inner lives, their emotions and vulnerabilities, stories that give thanks for sources of love and meaning in their life, that examine the expectations that they've experienced around masculinity, and that express their resistance to intersecting forms of oppression like racism and homophobia. So I'd like to introduce you now to the 16 men with whom I started this work 11 years ago. I love men. There are, there's social training, right? There's ideas of how boys and girls and men and women are supposed to act and look and feel. So I'm um, super nervous. Um, very nervous. It's time to break the cycle, to stop the alcohol abuse, to stop the violence of my father and the violence of my father's father, of all the men in my family who had killed in the name of honor. Yurtle or stall? Stall or yurtle? My body and my soul stepping into the spotlight. Yeah. I became hostage to an image of gender. Women good, men evil. I work out four hours a day. I work out when I sit on the couch. I decided to tell all my parents that I was gay. Stand aside while Felicia and I guide our children past racism and hate. This project is about healing. It's the place where the floss was yarn, gold teeth and bling ice on All day I'd been wondering if I could get it up. After all, they were about to cut my ball off. <laughs> it's not good for the libido. It feels so good to be back. I chose to be male to express it outwardly what I felt within, but I didn't choose and don't choose all the baggage that comes along with being a man in this society. This is to Jason and to Greg and to Steve and Chris and Dave. We are part of the silent majority of African-American men, and we are proud to be loving and compassionate. <laughs> So that was our first live event, 
And since then, we've held nearly 30 live productions in the US, Canada, Gaza and the West Bank, and Chile, where my family is from. And new ones are being created right now. So this is the initial group from Berkeley. And the bottom right fellow here is Galen. And I'll share a little bit of his story with you. So he shared with a Men's Story Project audience that he grew up experiencing physical violence from his dad, who said he was trying to toughen him up. And while he was hitting him, his dad would say, that doesn't hurt, quit complaining, be a man. Galen came home from school one day bruised from a fight, and instead of offering comfort, his dad said, how could you lose? Didn't I teach you to fight? You never let someone get back up. That was part of Galen's education in violence. He went on to use a lot of violence against other men and his girlfriend. But then he got to a point where he could no longer stand seeing the pain that he was causing to others, and he realized that he had to end the cycle of violence in his family. So he started going to therapy in men's groups. He made a sincere apology to his girlfriend. He sat in circles with women in his community who were holding him accountable. And as he shared his story with our audience of the Men's Story Project, he offered no excuses for his violence. He took responsibility for it. At one of our events where Galen spoke, a man from the audience approached him afterward and told him that his story made him see that he needed to get help to end his own abusive behavior. And Galen recently told me that sharing his story in public 10 years ago has been a turning point in his life. And since then, Galen has been leading and overseeing men's groups as part of his nonprofit in Oakland, helping other young men lead healthy lives. This is St. Louis University group. The fellow in the center is Hamid, and the guy sticking up his fingers like this in the back is Jack. I'll tell you about, a little bit about both of them. So this is Hamid. He is a doctor from Pakistan living in the US. After many years of being in the closet, he told his family that he's gay. They told him that this was abnormal and that he would be judged by people and the heavens. This was very painful for Hamid, but he decided that he needed to live openly as himself. So he told the audience at his Men's Story Project production about how he immersed himself in his local LGBTQ community. He decided to carefully watch all episodes of Will and Grace and he learned how to use hair products. <laughs> he has found joy as a self-expressed person. His life isn't perfect, but it's his. We put Hamid's story up online, and ever since then, people from around the world, uh, Africa, Asia, and the Middle East, have been reaching out to him, seeking his advice and support as they consider whether and how to come out to their own families. This is Jack. When he was a college baseball player, uh, his teammates had what they called the thousand pound challenge, where they competed to see who could have sex with a thousand pounds worth of women first. It was a very profound contest. And Jack was uncomfortable with this, but he didn't speak up. He was afraid of being ostracized from the group. But a few years later, in front of an audience of similar size, 300 people or so at his university, Jack acknowledged that by not calling out his teammates' misogyny, he had been an enabling man. He admitted that he was complicit by virtue of his silence, and he committed to speaking up in the future. And there have been so many more stories, like Galen's and Hamid's and Jack's. I am grateful to the men who've spoken about the joy of being loving, nurturing dads and partners. I'm grateful to the men who've spoken about unlearning homophobia, surviving sexual assault, getting help for porn addiction, committing not to tell sexist jokes at work anymore, facilitating a gang truce, and knowing what loneliness feels like, and therefore offering to be a listening ear for other men. I've seen that when men share these kinds of stories, they show people what's possible. 
Each of these presenters, more than 120 so far, has shown a real strength, not an armor of bravado, but the courage to be open, vulnerable, and real. And it's not easy. Many of them have stepped up to the mic sweating, papers visibly shaking in their hands, and doing it anyway because they believed that they had something to share that would be helpful if they share it for themselves and others. A key theme in the feedback that we've gotten over the years is men saying that in telling or hearing these stories, they discovered for the first time that they're not alone on experiences that they had never heard other men around them talk about. That it meant so much to them to, realize, to find other men who want to discuss these issues in community. And that it felt liberating to realize that there are as many ways to be a man in this world is there are male or masculine identifying people in it. And I've been blown away by the power of offering a bold but simple invitation, inviting men to share their true stories that challenge rigid notions of manhood and that take a stand for health and equality for everyone. Now that you've seen some of what the Men's Story Project is about, I want to share one of its early seeds with you on a more personal level. The first time a dear friend told me that she was sexually assaulted, we were both 14. And throughout my years in high school, more of my friends confided in me about their experiences with sexual assault and dating violence. And I used my voice to comfort and console and help my friends cope. I wasn't really thinking about social change back then. My freshman year of college at Penn, I went to my first Take Back the Night March, an event where people publicly share their own stories of surviving sexual assault. And a classmate of mine, who I always had thought seemed cool, stepped up to the podium and shared her story about being assaulted during freshman orientation week. That was the first time I saw a woman my age who I knew using her voice, in this case, not to comfort or console, but to call for change, to speak culture change into being by sharing her story. And that lesson in the power of public voice stayed with me and absolutely became one of the seeds of the Men's Story Project. So I'd like to close by inviting you. We all have the power to influence others in ways we might never imagine or know by sharing our own stories, questions, and journeys in progress. And it could be on a public stage, a private conversation, a social media post, mentoring, requesting mentorship, joining a campus group, and everything in between. The more of our silences we break and stories we share, the more freedom we stand to gain, and the more we'll help others see that they're not alone. We might inspire them to share their own stories and find their next steps forward. And shifting culture around masculinity is a big goal. But if made-up stories about manhood are contributing to key problems in the world today, a key part of the solution lies with each man's willingness to share your true stories, the ones that may be just beneath the surface, just waiting to be told. Thank you.